as a uh, source that I'm eager to uh, hear about on uh, morphogenesis of both the heart and the brain. And uh, early brain development in terms of its uh, morph morphology and mechanical processes and mechanical functions. So I received his uh, PhD from uh, Stanford, actually in aerospace engineering. He then worked a little bit as a research engineer in the bio biomedical science department of, um, of uh, General Motors in Michigan and Detroit. And then uh, spent time as an associate professor on the faculty of the uh, University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, before coming here. He's currently the Kessler Professor of Biomedical Engineering, was involved with the Kessler Chair not too long ago, and uh, a member of the Biomedical Engineering Department. Uh, Larry has published extensively in his uh, support from the NIH for his research both on heart and uh, brain. So, Larry. So,
see on the membrane or the folding are fusing from both top to bottom. And at this point, this is the heart tube popping out here. And, and these are those, 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 those the membranes continuing to fuse on the bottom. These are actually veins. And they continue to fuse. And now the heart is, is the, almost explodes up. And it leads to the right side of the embryo. So I'll run this one more time. Let's run it one more time. And you can see how these membranes, these membranes look like they're zipping from top to bottom, creating a heart tube. A chick embryo, dental, dental, dental view of a chick embryo at two days and three days of incubation. So at two days, the heart is already starting to beat. Actually, starts to beat about 30 hours uh, in the chick after fertilization. Um, at this time, the heart is just being uh, with enough force to start pumping blood. And if you look up here, this is the brain forming. Uh, a day later, the heart is moved completely around. The blood is put and so the blood is coming into this end, loops around and pumps out through the top, through the aortic arches, and down through the dorsal aorta. So some of you people are imaging people, so I have some very some nice OCT pictures. So what this is, this is a chick embryo, um, very looping. So here's the loose heart, here's the brain on top. And we're going to have a scan going from top to bottom. And on this side, I'm going to show you a cross section as it, as it scans from top to bottom. So if I start this, now we're going through the brain. This is the brain here. This is an, an, an optic vesicle. Yeah, so it's looking a pie for me. A little bit further. Now we're going to go down. We can see. The little tube forming down here. This is the heart now. So we're going through the heart. From the middle of the ventricle, here's the heart that loops to the right side of the embryo. And continuing up now. So this part. So this is OCT system is Ewars, and it's got about 10 microns of resolution. Um, and we're going to one more time. We can see things with this system that we've never seen before. So this is all in living tissue. So we can follow development in living embryos in three dimensions. Okay. So, with, so with these images, this gives us a stack of images. And with that, we can create a three-dimensional finite element model for the heart tube. Um, and this shows the, the path of inflation of that, of that model. Okay. Now, um, just to give you a little bit about what we're doing now and in the future, um, before I get into the, finish the looping, um, this is a three-dimensional OCT image of, of the embryo before there's a heart, so very early in development. What's happening up here, they're, they're just starting to get a little bit of folding. It's called the head fold. So, so the first folds in the embryo, right, which are shown here, again, it's called the, uh, the head fold. And, and the heart cells first migrate through this head fold. So one side of this, this little fold here starts to form the brain, um, the head, and the other side of the, of the same mound is where the first heart cells migrate to. So it seems like there may be some link between the two processes. Um, but these are very nice three-dimensional images that we that, that show us things that again that we've never seen being able to see before, at least in live tissue. And from that we can create these sagittal cross sections of the embryo. So there is a, a membrane that lies down below the embryo here. So at the top of the embryo, the ventral side would be up here. This is on the dorsal side of the embryo. And and uh, this is, these are cross sections for different times during development. 
over a period of uh, a few hours or so. And so this is the head bolt forming here. It, it, under normal conditions, this, this would be the head bolt. Okay? And one of the perturbations that we do, we, we do a lot of perturbations to try to understand development, and one of them is simply to remove this membrane. And again, these are OCT cross-sectional images that show the difference in the, or the effects of removing that membrane. So you can see that the head bolt really doesn't form if that membrane is removed. If you get the, you get the dip, the method, this, so this membrane is folding, but you don't get this, this folding over. Okay, so this, this is some of the things that OCT is allowing us to see. Okay, so now let me go back to, to looping. So looping is uh, mainly composed of, of, of two stages. First, during steam looping, the spray car tube bends and twists into this C-shaped tube. And so again, normally directed toward the right side of the embryo. The outer temperature comes right toward the other the right side of the embryo. The checkup then takes place over a period of roughly 12 hours or so. Then there's S looping when the heart continues to bend and twist until it finally forms what looks like a mature heart. So this looping takes the heart from the spring tube into the form of a mature heart, but it's still just a single tube at this time with the blood coming in here, going around and pumped out the top. And then over the next few days, a septum is going to grow here, and another septum is going to grow here with the two atria and the two ventricles. And so you can see how any abnormalities in this part of the looping process can cause abnormal abnormalities in mature hearts. So what is, in two days in the cheek embryo, in the third one, so how many days in the room? So, so I, it's probably it's three, I mean, three weeks and a couple of days. So no, humans, the, the first heartbeat is, is, not, is around three weeks, two and a half to three weeks. The chicken, the first heartbeat is 30 hours. Okay. Um, and so our main focus is on this first part of looping, which is the first major asymmetry that's observed in the embryo. The first major left right asymmetry. So our objective is to determine the biomechanical mechanisms that drive and regulate. And over the last hundred years, there have been a number of, 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 of a lot of people studying this problem, uh, developmental biology, and they proposed a lot of different hypotheses for what might cause looping. And one of the first of these well, was proposed by Patton in 1922, where he, he suggested that the heart tube is, is growing longer and it's simply constrained by its end so that it, so that it essentially buckles to one, to, to one side. Um, but they could not explain why the heart always goes to the right side. And also, other experiments later on showed, um, three years or so later, that if you pump the heart out of the embryo and put it in, in poultry, it will bend on its own without any external constraint. So, this is a stitch. Um, another idea that Salzberg investigated was the possibility that, that, that differential growth drives this bending. Uh, so for example, if you have so the body's faster on one side than they are on the other side, then it would cause the heart to bend in this form. We looked for patterns in, in mitosis and, and did not come up with any real clear patterns. And so, so this idea was possible. Well, Manisek uh, studied the problem for 10 to 15 years, and he came up with this idea that uh, that he assumed that this, so this, remember this layer of cardiac jelly is actually from an amnesia, and it's known that it swells. In the experiments, he showed that it swells up quite a bit. And so he thought, well, this, this, if it's filled with this jelly that swells, it's like a balloon was to inflate. And he suggested that if they're hypothesized that one side of the heart is stiffer than the other side, and then so he took a piece of tape, put it on this balloon, and blow it up, and you can see how it bends with the stiffer side on the along the inner curvature. So he said that's how, that's how the heart moves. And, and since then, in, about, uh, in the last several years, we went in and measured the stiffness and we found that, that it's true, that this side of the heart is a lot stiffer than, than the rest of the heart. However, other people have gone in and digested the cardiac jelly and find that the thing with that looping is perfectly fine. And so this idea is gone. Another idea, um, possibility, is that cells on one side of the heart contract to change the shape of, the, of, of these cells and cause it to bend. So a differential contraction. And Saki investigated this problem and, and gave evidence that this may be a possibility. 
However, I'm going to show in a few minutes that, that uh, why this is not, not a viable possibility. And then finally, um, this is about 35 years ago now that Madison proposed another idea before actually his other his, 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 uh, Jelly Swelling idea. He, he thought that active cell shape change is not due necessarily to contraction on uh, cause the heart to spin. <coughs> so if the cells on this side become shorter and these sides, the cells on this side become longer, it forces bending. Um, and then for unknown reason, he, he fell in love with this Jelly Swelling idea and he himself threw this, threw this idea out. However, now he thinks that that this actually may be what's going on. And I'll get into that. Okay, so one of the problems with, uh, with <coughs> experiments over the years, just trying to understand a little bit, is that, that, that most people really didn't, didn't understand the, the deformations that occur during movement. And, and you can see the, the, the uh, uh, problem. If you, if you consider a heart, uh, it, it's about 30 hours of incubation, stage 10. You put labels along the ventral midline of the heart, then you incubate it for six hours or so. And you can see how the labels move over, the, over toward, the, toward the outer curvature of the loop, too. So what this indicates is that the heart just doesn't just simply bend to the right, because if it did, these labels would be here in the middle of the, of the bend, too. So it's a combination of a ventral bending plus a rightward rotation. So here's my heart. The ventral bend it bends out this way and it rotates over to the right, plus the labels end up over here on the outer curve. And it's still papers today that are published, even though this, this has been known for a long time, this has been known for decades, that this is what goes on. It's still developing biologists who think that the bending of the heart to the right and so they misinterpret their, their experiments. And we find that we need to con consider these two deformation components separately. So, bending is, is best studied, as I said, if you take the heart out of the embryo and you culture it, 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 it will bend perfectly fine. And so, without the confounding effects of rotation or torsion, uh, bending is best studied in, in isolated heart and culture. And what this shows is that the bending, whatever forces cause this bending, are intrinsic to the heart bend. Now, it's been known for a long time that active is, is important for this process, as it is for almost everything. Um, and so we study the effect of inhibiting active polymerization at a very slow doses of cytoplasm in the trunculin A. And the control conditions, I mean, after 24 hours, you can see how the straight heart tube brings all the way around to a essentially touch. If we start at stage 11 with the heart started out a little bit bent, then it continues its bending until the end of touch. But under very low doses of either drug, we can see bending. The bending can either stop and prevent it from starting or stop dead in its tracks. So it seems clear that bending requires ongoing active polarization. So to give you a, uh, an idea of what the action looks like um, in these hearts, this, this is a, uh, under control conditions. This is your heart down here is, is much higher magnification. And you can see these, these rings very prominent rings of, of actin bundles around the cell border. Okay, under after 20, what was that? After 20 hours in, in a small dose of latrunculin A, the rings are still there, but they're much less prominent. They're starting to break up. Cytoplasm, the actin completely, the, the, the uh, actin filaments or fibers actually just break up completely. So you can see why cytoplasm might. Cytoplasm would stop moving because the actin is completely gone, but the trunculin has stopped moving by just making the fibers weaker. Okay, so when we look at the possible actin, uh, actin is called, again, it's a lot of cell process. We look at, we look at some of the possibilities. Again, cell division, differential cell division, cell multiplication has been ruled out. Actin is involved in cell crawling. But the myocardium at these stages is a very tight and puzzling epithelium. The cells don't get to exchange neighbors, so there's not much crawling around within the myocardium. And so this seems to not be a factor. Um, contraction, active myosin contraction is a possibility, and as well as, as active cell shape changes that are driven by active polymerization. So we investigated, so these two have been ruled out. We, this one, people thought was causing looping, investigated this one, and also this possibility. 
So if you look at the effect of contraction, we use myosin inhibitors, double myosin inhibitors, including uh, this one here, lactosomatin 3 pill or kinase inhibitor. We use love back in which it's uh, to understand the moon single inhibitor. And none of these had any effect on, on, on the bed. So we put it in, in high doses, relatively high doses of this drug, and in the bending was essentially normal. And so so then the problem became, if nothing happened, how do we know the drugs are doing anything? And that's, that's, that was a major problem. Um, now, one, so what we did, we did it, we looked at this in two, different, two different ways. First, we did a biochemical assay for mice and activation, and we found that it was much reduced. But mechanically, we also tested the stiffness of these hearts because um, contractility is, is associated with increased stiffness of the cells. And I'm talking about um, cytoskeletal contraction, slow cytoskeletal contraction. That's what um, drives morphogenesis in a lot of cases, not the heartbeat, not the sarcomeric contraction, that's, that, that's the rhythmic heartbeat. Okay, so to measure stiffness, we used this uh, microindentation device that was developed uh, several years ago by Evan Samir in my lab. Uh, so what we did, was, what Evan did was he, he cut out the heart, uh, held it on one side with a little bit of suction and a micro pipette, and on the other side he indented the heart, so this is a, a, a rigid glass tip that's attached to a very flexible glass beam. And so a motor moves this beam from side to side. This is actually uh, based on the cell poker of Elliot Allison, which on which AFM, the theory for AFM was based. Um, so we move the beam um, side this, this way, uh, the, the poker tip, the other tip contacts the heart, the beam bends, so we can measure the amount of bending and can, can calculate the force from the amount of bending. And then we can measure reflection, apply force versus reflection at, at any location in the heart. And so what we found was that under control conditions, this is a typical force reflection curve. This bump represents a heartbeat. Okay? Then we added uh, Y27632 to inhibit cytoskeletal contraction, and the stiffness given by the slope, let's say the anti-solid stiffness given by the slope of these curves between beats, dropped significantly by a factor of three to four within 45 minutes or so. So this indicated the drug was, in fact, um, having an effect on, on uh, movement, I mean, on contraction. Now another possibility is that uh, um, when we when we culture these hearts, oh, forget this slide. That was in the wrong place. Okay. So the bending. So the conclusion is that the bending is not caused by a cytoskeletal contraction. Okay. So our hypothesis then. We reduce down to one hypothesis at the moment anyway, is, is that we assume that this bending is driven by differential changes in cell shape that are driven by forces of active summarization. So again, if the cells, and they do start out to be have the same shape in the straight tube, so the end of stay looping, these cells are longer, these cells are shorter in one single direction, and we, we assume that that is what drives bending. Uh, one test of this <coughs> hypothesis in terms of the computational modeling. We created a, a three-dimensional finite element model for the heart tube, and we simulated longitudinal um, and circumferential polarization on, on the out, on this side of the heart, um, because we see actin strip fibers arranged in both directions on this side, whereas on this side we see only circumferential oriented actin fibers, so we, we, we simulated circumferential polarization on this side, and you can see that the heart tube bears very similar shape to what you see in vivo, not in vivo, in vitro, um, and concluding that the back side of the heart stays relatively straight and this lower front side bulges out. I don't know if I, I didn't know if I should include this slide in here, um, just to give you a, a feeling for how we simulate uh, polarization and growth and contraction in these models. Polarization we essentially, sim essentially simulate through growth. And so if we consider a, a body, some body that has no stress, we, we model growth in the following way. And, 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 and so we, 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 the best to visualize it through a series of configurations. 
So first we, we, we imagine that we set this body into a, to a set of infinitesimal pieces. Okay, so they just come apart, there's still no stress. Then we let each, let each of these pieces grow as they want. To go in different ways in different directions, different amounts in different directions. And then each piece will then contract through this. So, so, these, so the growth is, is defined through this growth tensor. The contraction is defined through this activation tensor. And so essentially each piece becomes a different shape. Then we try to reassemble the, these pieces into the uh, original body, but these usually these pieces will not fit together. To make them fit together like pieces of a puzzle, you have to deform them to make them fit. And that, that generates a stress. Even though there's no load in the tissue, this, this growth and contraction generates a stress in the tissue in, in most cases. That's called residual stress because there are no loads, but there's stress in the tissue. And then we load the tissue. So we, we, we simulate growth by specifying the values of this growth tensor and activation uh, contraction by, by specifying the values of this activation tensor. Yes. Okay, so that's, how, that, so that's the part of the uh, uh, of moving the bent, the bending part of it. Now, next, let's, on the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus only on the torsional part that comes at the same time as the bending. And whereas bending, is, we feel, is, is we know is driven by forces that are intrinsic to the heart failure, torsion, we have found, is driven by forces that are external to the heart failure, applied by, by surrounding tissue. Some of these forces can be caused by these two veins. Um, that are zipping together and form the bottom part of the, of the heart tube, and these later on become the atria. And also, there can, there's a connection to the outflow tract on the top that, can, that, that constrains the heart. If we look at a cross section of the uh, chick embryo, so this is a neural tube here, here's the heart tube. You can see also that there's a membrane that overlies the heart tube, presses against it, that's called the splenic part. And at this stage, the heart tube also is connected along the back side to the foregut of the embryo. So it's important to, to especially in those <coughs> that are at this point. Okay. So this simple experiment gives us some idea of what's going on. So here's a, uh, a, a straight heart tube. The labels are uh, injected along the left and right sides of the tube. After six hours in culture, the labels along the left side of the tube rotate over to toward the top surface of the heart. The labels on this side rotate behind the heart, the red one directly behind the heart, as it should indicate the tube is rotating. Then the, the membrane that covers the heart is, was removed. And almost immediately, these labels pop back up toward uh, the left and right side, indicating a loss of rotation, of some of the rotation. And then the two veins on the bottom were cut off and the remainder of the rotation was, was, was lost. So from this simple experiment, we conclude that the splenic fluid, the membrane over the heart, and the two veins, or which are the primitive atria, drive early torsion. So our general hypothesis, a working hypothesis for torsion, is, is shown by the schematic. Um, so this is the ventral view of the heart. This is a cross-sectional view showing the splenic fluid, the membrane over here, it's pressing against the surface of the heart tube. We have evidence that shows that these two veins are both pushing, actually cells are, are moving in toward the heart and they both push against the caudal end of the heart tube. And uh, we, have, we, we, we have evidence that the, the left vein pushes with a little bit more force than the right vein, gives the heart just a little bit of a jog to the right side. And then this membrane pushes the heart backward and the rest of the way, rotates the rest of the way rightward. So what this model would predict is that if we could reduce the force in the left vein below that in the right vein, we could get opposite directed looping to the left. And so this slide shows an experiment where a piece of this left vein was removed um, to reduce the force in this vein. And in a significant number of embryos, we did get less looping, which very rarely occurs under normal conditions. So this seems to support our hypothesis. To take a little bit more, a little bit more detailed look at this hypothesis, a little bit more deeper look at the, the, the details of the mechanics of the uh, looping, uh, we again created a three-dimensional finite element model for the straight heart tube. 